In April of 1996, I was sitting in a jail cell. The doctor at the jail was threatening to tube feed me because I had lost around 80 pounds from refusing to eat. My lawyer told me that the psychiatrist was going to have me sent to my third mental hospital. I was 20 years old. I had hurt everyone around me. My life was destroyed, and I just didn't care. The only thing that kept me going at all was that there were more people I wanted to hurt. I viewed human beings as disgusting blobs of cells, cosmic accidents, delusional wastes of consciousness. The faster we were all wiped out, the better. Then I got slapped in the face by the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus died by crucifixion. It was a public event. He was buried in a tomb. By Sunday morning, his tomb was empty. Then Jesus began appearing to men and to women, to friends and to foes. Those who met the risen Jesus were changed forever, and many of them went to their horrible, bloody deaths, proclaiming that he is Lord. Nearly 2,000 years later, the resurrection of Jesus is still the most important event in history. Here's what it means to Dr. Gary Habermas, Dr. William Lane Craig, Dr. Mike Lacona, and Dr. Michael Brown. In the New Testament, there are over 300 verses on the resurrection of Jesus. When we talk resurrection, we usually think two things, apologetics, soteriology, salvation, and it's really relevant to both. It is salvation, it is eternal life, and here's the reasons for it. That's the two things. But actually, these 300 verses are tied to almost every major area of theology in the New Testament, and many of the major areas of practice in the New Testament. Of all the areas of practice that are tied to the resurrection, the most common one, almost 20 times, just short of 20 times, is that believers will be raised like Jesus. You think of uh, 1 John, we shall see him as he is and we shall be like him. Paul, Philippians 3, he will change our vile body to be like unto his glorious body, and Paul just got done talking about resurrection. Those, those verses tell us that in a very special way, the resurrection of Jesus determines our resurrection. I think about 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul says, I'm depressed, but not totally wiped out. I'm beaten down, but not destroyed. I'm perplexed, but not ready to give up. I'm going strong. And he says, the reason I am, 2 Corinthians 4, is because God will raise me up with you and present us together before Jesus. You've got Jesus' resurrection, Paul's resurrection, the resurrection of those in his churches who came to Jesus, and they're going to be presented together so you have fellowship all together around the throne of God with the risen Jesus. These are neat verses, but almost 20 times we're going to be raised like Jesus. 1 Peter 1, 3, 4, 5, great verses. He says, hey, you guys are being persecuted. That's okay. Uh, because just keep in mind, Jesus has been raised from the dead, verse 3, and heaven has been secured for you, and then he uses four Greek words, but what they amount to is nobody can take heaven away from you. It's guarded. I believe the Greek word once is, is garrisoned, as with an army. It can't be taken from you. It can't fade. It can't disappear. It's garrisoned. So just think, Jesus is raised. You'll be raised. Nobody can take it from you. So what's so cool about this is, yeah, it's Jesus' resurrection and our resurrection, but in between we're living and we're ministering. And Peter says, ignore as much as you can. The persecution isn't the key. It's that, to paraphrase Jesus, your names have been written in the book of life. So let's live now like our names are written in the book of life. Let's go out there and not be afraid what people say to us. Let's go out there and preach. But it's all a straight line from resurrection to my resurrection, back to what am I doing right now, and I shouldn't be so worried about persecution. In 1971, John Lennon published the song, Imagine, and in it he talks about, imagine there's no heaven, imagine there's no afterlife, uh, no countries, things like this. Think about this for a moment, let's imagine it. I think about the woman who has been trapped in bondage and in sex slavery for years and dies in that sense. I think of the African-American who was falsely accused by a white man so that the white man could be free and the African-American man spent 
a majority of his adult life, perhaps even his entire adult life, in prison for a crime he never committed. If we imagine that God does not exist, that there's no heaven, then there is nobody who will hear the cries of the injustices that have been done to these sort of folks. Um, we see that if God does not exist, if there's no heaven, then goodness is not rewarded. Injustice is not answered. And death is final. Our life, no matter how good or, or rotten it was, this is it. There's all there, this is all there is. And that um, our loved ones, our friends who die, we will never see them again. So if God does not exist, if there's no heaven, it is a terrifying thought. But imagine if there is a heaven, if God does exist, then injustices will be answered, goodness will be rewarded, and death is not final. But how do we know which worldview is correct? How do we know if God exists? The resurrection of Jesus. Jesus himself said that if you killed him, he would rise from the dead, and that would be proof that he was who he claimed. And the Apostle Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. So everything rides on the resurrection. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, Christianity is false. And if atheism is true, this is a bitter reality that we would all need to face. But if Jesus rose from the dead, Christianity is true. Injustice will be answered. Goodness will be rewarded. And death is not final. The resurrection matters enormously because it implies that Jesus holds the key that unlocks the door to eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And so I think we find in the resurrection of Jesus the answer to the human predicament, man's greatest enemy and challenge, and that is the enemy of death. The resurrection of Jesus tells us that death is not the end, that Jesus has conquered death, and that through faith in him we too can enjoy a personal relationship with God and eternal life. And so I find in the resurrection of Jesus really the key to human existence and the answer to the human predicament. Everything comes down to the resurrection. It, it's, it's that simple. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then he was not the Messiah. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, he did not fulfill the scriptures, the prophecies of the Hebrew Bible. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then our hope is in vain, our faith is in vain. If Jesus did not die for, and rise, then his death has no significance. His death was just another death. His death is vindicated. His death is proven. The purpose of his death is seen by his resurrection. If he stayed in the grave, it's over. His disciples were misled. All those who've called on his name were misled. In fact, we probably wouldn't even know his name today. Yeshua was a very, very common name among first century Jews. And there were Jews who were crucified by the Romans, thousands, tens of thousands. He would have been just another victim of crucifixion. You say, but what about his miracles? What do they prove? There are all kinds of alleged miracle workers. But what about his great teaching? Well, that's nice, but we probably never would have even had it recorded. Everything comes down to the resurrection. The fact that the resurrection happened is all I need to know that he rose from the dead and then ascended to heaven. That's all I need to know. In my roughest day, in my toughest day, when everything is going wrong around me, when it seems there's no hope in this world, all I need to know, all we need to know, is that Jesus rose from the dead. That also means the rest is going to happen. That also means that he will return one day and establish his perfect kingdom on the earth. That also means that every prophecy in scripture will be fulfilled. It also means that God is absolutely trustworthy. We will all go through dark times. We will all go through times when it seems that all hope is lost. Remember, he rose from the dead, and therefore it's not trite to say hope springs eternal. The resurrection confirms it all. The resurrection seals it all. The resurrection guarantees it all. But when Lee Strobel interviewed me years ago uh, for The Case for Christ, uh, he asked me at the end, what does resurrection mean to you? And as I remember the chapter party wrote, he said, 
I expected Gary to say what everybody says. Uh, it's the center of everything. It's the center of theology. It's the center of practice. But he said, Gary didn't quite do it that way. And I turned the page in the manuscript and I saw what he was going to say next. It was entitled, The Resurrection of Debbie, my wife who had just died of stomach cancer, the mother of my four children who had just died of stomach cancer. And I said, Lee, where the rubber meets the road for me is that the resurrection of Jesus says I will see Debbie again. I will see my grandparents, my godly grandparents, my great-grandmother, who was the closest person to me in my life when I was a little kid before she died, closer than my parents. Resurrection says I will be with them. Again, remember the 2 Corinthians chapter 4 uh, text. Jesus is raised. I'll be raised. You'll be raised with me, and we'll be presented with Jesus. Fellowship. And I said, that's really, Lee, that's what resurrection means to me, being with my family, being with my, my raised um, friends and family members forever. And Debbie, haven't seen her since 1995, being together in a heartbeat, that's what resurrection says to me. When I started to realize that Jesus rose from the dead, my view of myself and of other people and of the world had to change. If I was going to listen to anyone tell me about the meaning of life or morality or the value of a human being, I was going to listen to the one who rose from the dead. Best decision anyone could ever make. If you haven't thought much about the resurrection, I encourage you to spend some time reading some books or watching some videos or lectures from people like Dr. Habermas, Dr. Craig, Dr. Lacona, and Dr. Brown. If you find out they're wrong about the resurrection, all you've lost is a little bit of time. But if you find out they're right about the resurrection, you've still lost a little bit of time, but you've gained eternity. Welcome to the resurrection, where your last breath is not your last breath.